It's October 17th, 1814, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Swimming in a river of beer might seem like a booze hound's dream come true, but the reality was very different today in history in 1814, when a terrifying tsunami of beer swept through a London slum after an explosion at a brewery released half a million litres of hot fermenting porter. Yeah, you asked us once, Ollie, what we would like to drown in if we had to drown. And I've been sort of thinking about it ever since. And I haven't really come to a good <laughs> conclusion. But I know there's one thing I wouldn't want to drown in, and that's porter. Reading about this <laughs> this subject, I was like, that is horrific. Of all the beers you'd possibly have to get stuck under, that's not the one you want. So Mukes's Porter, which is what was being brewed at the Horseshoe Brewery on Tottenham Court Road at this time, was one of the more popular varieties of Porter, which was the kind of English-born beer sensation of the century, really. There was kind of like a competition between London manufacturers of Porter to do it bigger, do it better, be the main brewery in Britain. And Mukes's Porter was a really popular one. They also made Imperial London Stout as well. If you want a kind of modern day comparison, something a bit like Meantime London Porter. So it was a hugely popular beer. Mm. And as a kind of competitive advantage in the race between the various Porter breweries of London, to make this hometown brew that everyone was very proud of, They'd created a 22-foot-high <laughs> beer fermentation tank, which is what exploded. Who would have thought that could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you mentioned, vats were a brewery status symbol at the time and rival firms were vying for the largest. And in particular, the head of the company, Sir Henry Mukes, wanted to emulate his father, who had famously built the largest vat in the city. This is what all things boil down to eventually, his sons yeah. trying, to, uh, trying to compete with their fathers. Uh, so Mukes's new vat, as you mentioned, 22 feet tall at 6.7 meters it was secured with iron hoops weighing 320 kilos and on the day of the beer flood it was holding 581,800 liters of porter which had been in there for 10 months so it was almost completed the process of fermentation and it was hot and that's one million pints. Yeah. One million pints of beer. It's a whole lot of beer. And so at 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, the storehouse clerk, George Crick, was looking around this massive beer vault just to check that everything was, uh, was the way it ought to be. And he looked down, apparently, from above and saw that one of these enormous 700-pound hoops that was meant to be holding the whole tank together had slipped. But he went straight to his boss and said, look, this has happened. And his boss told him, basically that no harm would come from the fact that this hoop was now not in position. To... Well, it was a frequent occurrence, apparently. Well, true. So know, they... This had happened before. Of course. The, things break and you have to fix them. And yeah, so... Of course. If you build a massive tank holding three and a half thousand <laughs> barrels of brown port rail, hoop's going to burst. Again, what could go wrong? <laughs> there must be a fallacy for this. I'm not sure what the fallacy is, but the idea of, well, the hoop slipped before and nothing bad's happened, so <laughs> probably nothing bad will happen this time. And knowing what's, you know, being able to see in retrospect what happens afterwards it's so mad that the reaction when he raised the alarm about this loose hoop was someone said oh just leave a note yeah you know leave yeah. a note for the next guy saying well, it's 1814 <laughs> writing a letter is as fast as you could do stuff rebecca <laughs> true you know there wasn't a hotline to the beer <laughs> yeah, but police he didn't, he didn't tell him to take the note he was literally like leave a note because it was half past four he was almost finished he's like mm, we'll get that looked at you know put a post-it note on the vat <laughs> well regardless even as he sat down to write that note he heard a massive explosion and he then raced to find out what had happened and realized that yes the vat uh, contrary to what his boss had just told him, had burst into splinters. The blast broke off the valve of an adjoining cask that also contained thousands of barrels of beer, and that set off this chain reaction. Yeah, it's all reaction. pressurised, yeah. so that's why you get this trigger kind of reaction of, like, fireworks. Yeah, so basically the whole brewery then explodes, sending 570 tonnes of liquid streaming onto the streets. And George Crick later told the coroner during an inquest that he ran to the storehouse where the vat was. He was above his knees in beer. He was shocked at the sight that presented itself to his view. One side of the house, this is the, the brew house, upwards of 25 feet in height with a considerable part of the roof lay in ruins. And Crick's own brother, who also worked at the brewery, was among the workers being pulled out of the debris by some of their colleagues. And as soon as the injured men were cleared, the employees set about trying to salvage as much of the beer as possible. And what nobody at the time was paying attention to to was what was happening mm. on the other side of the burst wall mm. in this slum area on New Street. It was part of a notorious slum area that had inspired Hogarth's Gin Lane 60 years 
earlier and by all accounts hadn't improved that much since. And this was the street that was now receiving the full force of this tsunami of beer. Yeah, and the victims who received that full force of beer against their windows and doors were mostly women and children because it was happening during office hours. So most of the men would have been at work. So you had um, a woman sitting down to afternoon tea with her two kids that got drowned. Uh, You had five people, ironically, who died at a wake. They were commemorating the death of a two-year-old in a basement and the mother of that two-year-old then drowned in beer that Mm. came through and swept them all off their feet. It's absolutely horrendous. And the buildings themselves were being swept along the street as well because they were not exactly high-quality structures. You also had bricks raining down onto the street because, you know, I think I at least approached this with this mental image of just liquid flowing into the streets, but actually the whole building exploded. And a woman named Eleanor Cooper was actually struck by one of these bricks. So it was a totally catastrophic scene. Yeah, just to go into who was killed and how, the way that many of the victims died was because they were living in cellars. This was a slum area, and Mm. a lot of people actually lived below ground in basement areas. There was no centralised sewage system at the time, so there were no drains and gutters for the beer to flow into. It literally just filled up the houses from the basements upwards. Mm. So the first victim was four-year-old Hannah Bamfield. She was the one who was drinking tea with her mother and a friend, and they were swept out into the street, and she was killed. And then just a few doors down, this wake was being held in the cellar. And so four mourners were killed, including a three-year-old boy and the boy's mother, Anne Saville. An interesting macabre detail was that an hour and a half after the explosion, the former and George Crick found the body of Anne Saville floating among the butts mm. and her body was then carried to a local public house, ironically. I mean, I guess there were just a lot of pubs around so it was a mm. place that made the most sense. And yeah, the wave swept through the yard of the Tavistock Arms, which is part of the site of the Bloomsbury Hotel now, where 14-year-old servant Eleanor Cooper was washing pots. She was later found dead in the rubble of the destroyed wall. So there was real force behind this as well. It wasn't just people drowning because the cellars they were in filled up. It was so powerful. It was knocking down houses as well. But then, though, not for the people who died tragically, not for the people who felt the full full force of the explosion, not for the people that were discovering corpses outside the pub, but for everyone else, when beer comes trickling past your door and you don't know why, is there a kind of magical Willy Wonka moment (laughs) (laughs) at seeing the street turn to beer? Did people go scooping it up in cups? Yes. Or were people sensible enough to know, ooh, this has got mixed with sewage and dead people? Because that is very hard to find an authoritative source on that. Yeah, one of the things that I found suggested that there were reports, at least, of the death of a ninth victim some days later, and that was due to alcohol poisoning, leading to the suspicion that this person wasn't alone, that for a lot of people this was a big sort of unexpected kind of beer festival. Knees up. Yeah, so yeah. so I, I can't imagine that particularly given that this happened in a slum, that some people wouldn't have been tempted. I think there's a neat version of the story, which is the one that I wanted to tell, which was that, you know, the accounts of these, you know, the subtext being these cheery Irish slum dwellers were reveling in the free beer, but obviously that the true story was one of death and destruction and who in their right mind would be drinking hot, stinking beer Mm. that's just swept through one of the filthiest corners of London and basically be drinking a swamp. So the image of people drinking from this river of beer was a a classist, anti-Irish sentiment. And it's true that there aren't really any contemporary reports of this happening. That said, I did then look into a similar occurrence happened in Dublin in 1875, the Dublin Whiskey Fire, where we do have contemporary <laughs> accounts of locals drinking from the stream of whiskey, whiskey that was literally on fire in some instances, <laughs> filling empty containers. Right, and the thing about this is that there were 13 deaths in the Whiskey Fire, and you think, well, yeah, from the title, it seems pretty dangerous. But none of those were due to the fire itself. They were able to evacuate the area really rapidly. No one died as a result of the fire or the flooding all 13 deaths were of alcohol poisoning so from the title it seems dangerous you know people at the time rebecca aren't saying but this is the great whiskey fire we should go near this (laughs) they're just saying there's a big puddle of alcohol outside my door (laughs) and bizarrely considering the amount of coverage the tragedy got we only have one surviving eyewitness account which came from of all people an anonymous american visitor Mm. it's god only knows what brought him to that corner of london at that time and he didn't write about it for another 20 years and then there was an article published in an American magazine I think it really puts you in the moment keep in mind that the wave of beer was 15 foot high Mm. so he wrote (laughs) 
All at once I found myself borne onward with great velocity by a torrent which burst upon me so suddenly as almost to deprive me of breath. A roar as of falling buildings at a distance and suffocating fumes were in my ears and nostrils. I was rescued with great difficulty by the people who immediately collected around me and from whom I learned the nature of the disaster which had befallen me. That sounds like Keanu Reeves in Dracula. (laughs) Tomorrow. There were people who claimed they saw ninjas running at super speed, that they could climb impossibly high walls, they could fly through the air. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAST Creator Network.